into this um, discussion of diversity, or actually, um, one could say the lack of it when it comes to financial services. Um, and we'll be talking about um, some ways in which progress could be perhaps speeded up. Um, this discussion is um, organized by the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation, of which I'm senior fellow. And we're doing it um, as ever in partnership with the London Institute of Banking and Finance, with, with who, which we have a long and fruitful uh, relationship. Um, we have three speakers, um, Corey Knight, who's an LIBF graduate and advocate for supporting younger generations in personal and career development. Um, he's been predominantly involved in internal audit since he started his career. And he's worked for a multinational bank, um, one of the UK's leading asset managers, and is currently at the London Stock Exchange Group. Um, Ellen Carr is co-author with Katrina Dudley of the wonderfully named Under Undiversified, the big gender short in investment management. Uh, she's fixed income portfolio, portfolio manager at Barksdale Investment Manage Management and adjunct professor at Columbia Business School. And her early career was spent as a portfolio manager at Capital Group. And Mark Hoban, who chairs the Financial Services Skills Commission. Um, he also chairs Flood Ray, Pay UK, and the Jersey Financial Services Commission. Um, Mark was Conservative MP for Fairham from 2001 to 2015. And during that time, his roles included Minister for Employment and Financial Secretary to the Treasury. So just a, a brief in introduction before we get going. I'm, I'm old enough to have been influenced by the women's liberation movement dating back to the 1960s. Um, describe myself as a women's liber rather than a feminist for reasons I won't bore you with at this stage. <laughs> then fast forward to Oppo Opportunity 2000. Lo and behold, um, there still hadn't been that much progress. And here we are today where there has been limited progress. For example, the 30% club has indeed achieved um, you know, 30% plus uh, board representation for women for the FTSE 100, or maybe 350 actually. Um, so some progress, but this is 60 years on. And this is, and one should say that the progress in gender diversity and inclusion has been better than for ethnic minorities. So this, that just gives you a sort of snapshot of how far there is to go. Um, so we're going to start with uh, with Corey Knight, who has obviously has real world experience of this and is uh, nice, nice and young, unlike me, <laughs> <laughs> and can so is, uh, can tell us more how it is how it is now. So, so Corey, would you like to to, to start off our our debate? Sure. So, if I give a kind of brief um, brief kind of chronology of how I kind of got into financial services and kind of my career path. Um, it, it kind of all started when I was probably, um, I want to say, you know, 18, 19, but it was probably after that that I wanted to get into financial services. Um, so I, 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 at first I wanted to be a teacher. Um, so I, I, I applied for um, kind of going into teaching at Greenwich University. Um, but I was told that I didn't have enough real, real life classroom experience. Um, so essentially I kind of thought to myself, what can I, what can I do after to college that will basically give me a, a platform to have a long, long career. Um, so my mum's always been kind of in accounting and, and business. Um, and she's always kind of guided me down that route of, you know, maybe accountancy or business or um, something to do with corporate organisations. Um, so I decided to apply for, for Brighton University um, and I did finance and investment, um, which was a very, very hard qualification to do. Um, but at the same time, I had a, you know, a, a young child, a, a son on the way. Um, and to, to balance that out and kind of do the, the commute was, was difficult. I kind of managed to just scrape it through my first year um, and then quickly realised that I, I probably can't sustain this for the full four years of the programme. So then I kind of decided to go back to work 
um, I was working in um, sales. So I was doing commission-based sales for a, a, a kind of one of the marketing companies, uh, you know, door-to-door, business-to-business. Um, and what was, was expected, my second child after that. <laughs> um, and then again, quickly realised that I can't sustain a family just on commission-based work. Um having, you know, four mouths to feed at the time and kind of putting a roof over our heads and um, having that consistency because, you know, you know, wages and salaries going up and down, you never know how much you're going to earn on a week-to-week basis. Um, and I was very aware that I, I didn't want to put my my young children through that kind of instability. As, as young as I was, I think I was possibly like 9, 20 at the time. And being so young, you can kind of, you can wing your way through that a little bit if it was by yourself, but to have, you know, two dependent young, young children, um, you know, I, I kind of had to, to, to find a, the way to, you know, provide that, provide that consistency for them. Um, so yeah, that's when I decided to go through clearing and decide, you know, what do I want to do? Um, and LIBF gave me an opportunity. Um, I met with um, Sandra Edwards, um, and she quickly made it, you know, um, a sort of platform for me that she said, you know, this is our first year that we're doing full time, you know, undergraduate qualifications. And it could be a real platform for, for, for young people to get into financial services due to our kind of connections to the industry. Um, and that very much presented itself in a way to me to say that's a very exciting opportunity to, to, to just have a level of exposure. At, at its minimum to say you know speakers and you know um kind of industry professionals come into the university to speak to you and to kind of give you that path and that that encouragement and that enthusiasm to to say that potentially you can do this as uh, as quickly and as easily as I did if you apply yourself um so I went through the free year program at um at LIBF and in our second year, there's a module to do um, something called advanced work-based learning, which is ultimately um, just an internship program. Um, and my one was a bit, bit tricky. Um, I was offered an opportunity at an asset manager in, in, I think it was Wigan, um, but they they pulled out of the the internship program. I also applied at um, HSBC. Um, and kind of got through the screening processes at HSBC. Um, and they said, because I didn't get A in English and an A in maths, um, I wouldn't have the opportunity to join a graduate program. So joining an internship program would basically be a waste of time. Um, so essentially I had to kind of navigate through to see where other opportunities can, can come from. And, and luckily, um, again, Sandra, my, my savior, um, basically said to me because I've you know I've made certain progresses from my first year into my second year and my first year was quite difficult um, uh, and it wasn't one that was kind of my grades were kind of up and down um, kind of lateness and not you know really showing that consistency and and having that young mentality of you know it's not the end of the world Um, I just showed a, a, you know, steps and significant pros, progress to, to demonstrate that I'm a, I'm, I can be reliable. Um, so, so the team kind of offered me this opportunity to join Barclays on an internship program. Um, and I was over the moon because I, I, to be honest with you, I didn't think I would have had a, an opportunity if, if that didn't happen. Um, so I joined the internship program at, at Barclays. Um, and it was meant to be just an eight week program. And there was a group of us, I think there was four or five of us from LRBF who went there. And we, we, we set a good example for ourselves and, uh, and Barclay decided to extend us from a, an eight week internship program to a six month internship program. Um, and then they extended us for till 12 months. Um, and then after the 12 months decided to give us full time opportunities if you know going through the interview process, um, and we were successful. Luckily enough, we were all successful and we all managed to um, join the Barclays internship program. Um, 
so I kind of started out in Barclays internal audit on their internship program, learning how to, to audit. And I think the biggest challenge was to learn how the corporate environment works. Um, simple things like writing an email, possibly, um, just understanding your stakeholders and managing expectations. Those were some difficult um, learning curves and just coming from a you know university uh, background and not having that corporate education almost yes. to say this is this is what it's, this is what it's like this is what you know the diverse you know backgrounds are like and you know the seniorities and the the hierarchy and people from different you know walks um of life they all have different expectations um and that was very difficult for me to adjust to um just because i was you know from a from a university just you learn how to write long essays and you learn how to draw it drag everything out and you learn how to you know explain your points and to analyze and to critique and then to conclude and I thought that's how you write an email <laughs> um, and then you know it took me you know close to six months just to come out of that mindset and to come into the the business and corporate mindset of you know some people like things very concise and very to the point and mm. You know, it, it, it wasn't as straightforward as, as it painted itself to be at first. Yeah. So, so as your career has developed and um, how have you, what, are there any particular obstacles that you found or anything that when looking back, you think that really shouldn't have happened or should have been done differently? And, and tell us, just update us a bit about your career. And I, I think that the, the first obstacle that I faced was probably the, the, the time when I wanted to go into teaching. I think that going to a university and the, the course was to become a, to go into primary education. Um, I, I, I felt that that was a bit of a knockback because, because I didn't have, you know, I think 30 hours or 35 hours, whatever it is to, of real classroom experience meant that I couldn't be a teacher. Um, and to kind of paint everyone with that same brush to say, you have to, have this level of classroom experience without giving the opportunity for, for someone to go away or to kind of say, look, these are the opportunities that maybe we have um, for you to get that classroom experience or to maybe get that on the journey as well. Uh, I, I felt like that was a real knockback for me to, to not even be given the opportunity to, 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 to even take. Um, so that was a, a real obstacle for me. Um, if I roll back the years a, a little bit further, um, I joined a, a football academy program um, in kind of like 17 to 19 years old. So during college days um, and it, the whole point of the academy was to become a professional footballer um, uh, with a, a professional football team. However, you know, many of us didn't get those contracts um, and didn't, didn't kind of get the the, the glamorous career that we was hoping for in, yeah. in terms of do you, think, do you think just one question because um I mean um and I, I don't mind the language but um it, if, I was, if this was a gender debate one would say you know talk about sex stereotyping suggesting that you, you know people go into nursing or the civil service or one day teaching for women um do you think there was gender stereotyping in you going into football initially I, I think so I think that the the gender stereotype comes mainly from role models. Um, yeah, sorry, I mean um, race stereotyping going in, going into football. There's definitely a, an element of that, in my opinion. I think that um, that would be because um, from being from a working class background, and you know, I lived on an estate when I was younger. Um, the the most glamorous lifestyle that people lived was be, being a footballer or a yeah. musician, or you know, some in, in entertainment in, to some capacity. Um, and, you know, again, being from a working class background, you don't think about the slow and steady. You think about how can I get to um, to the riches as quick as possible? Um, yeah. And, 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 that's, and that's, yeah. that's the glamorous side of it. And that's that's what you want. You know, that's your aspirations to yeah. to live well. And have you, uh, um, and just a last question, because we'll just bring some of the other, bring, bring some of the other speakers in um, as, as you've moved on through, obviously, you spent some time at Barclays, you've been at an asset manager, now you're at the London Stock Exchange. Are there, are there any more recent um, instances where you, you felt you might have been treated differently or, or that the, the sort of institutional culture that you encountered was just, you know, you know, a bit more of a shock to the system than 
Brothers. Uh, I, I don't think there's been anything explicitly to me. There's definitely been, you know, some unconscious bias um, that I've seen. Um, mainly, I think this is mainly like down to human nature that I like you because you look like me or you mm -hmm. act like me or you are, you know, we have the same interests. Um, and generally speaking, I think that that's the, the general consensus around the, the, the corporate world is that a lot of um, a lot of individuals will give opportunity to people that they have common ground with, um, whether that be with their background, whether that be their interests, whether that be um, because you know I'm male or female, or just the the general way we we look. Um, yeah. I definitely feel like those opportunities are are um, are easily accessible to to people from similar backgrounds and similar kind of you know interests. Um, uh, and I've, I've, I've kind of encountered having children young. I had my first child when I was 19 and my second when I was 20, having, having children fairly, fairly young that definitely encountered kind of certain, uh, not stereotypes, but more so a, a bit, bit of judgment. Um, again, being from an ethnic minority kind of think it, it's, it's seen as a, a, a normal thing to from a working class background to have children young. Um, and it definitely was something that I experienced having those sort of judgments to say, oh, you've got children young. Um, that's, that, that, that's not surprising. Or some people were very surprised by it and kind of looked at me and, and said, you know, almost felt sorry for me because I had children so young and they couldn't comprehend that. Why would someone want to have children so young and without experience in life? Um, but I never saw it as something really direct to me. It was ma mainly just down to, gen it was a general thing um, yeah. and, and just a, a perception that there's life circumstances that some people would like and some people wouldn't. Yeah, thanks. Um, right, um, now I'd like to bring Ellen in, but I'm, I'm aware that she, she needs to go and um, get, her, get her son ready to the school briefly in about 10 minutes time. So Ellen, would you, uh, we can either um, respond to, what Corey's just said, or do your introduction and then scoot off and... Yeah, I have a little, so, so uh, very unlike Corey, um, I had my child when I was 40, so mm. <laughs> at the other side of life, I guess. We have a diverse say. panel. <laughs> yes, yes, it's diverse in many ways. Um, Corey, I love some of the the things you said, and maybe I'll, I'll start with those that, that we echoed in the book. So Jane mentioned that I just co-authored a book called Undiversified, which is about the lack of women in the investment management industry. Um, and we dealt specifically with gender diversity because both of us are white women. So um, we did not delve into some of the challenges facing um, minorities in our industry, but obviously, as Jane mentioned, the data for them is if anything worse than from a gender perspective. Um, so taking a step back, just maybe architecting the, the framework for the book, one of the, the questions that Jane posed to us is, what is the case for diversity? And without being overly negative in the book, we really had this aha moment of looking on the one hand at the performance of the investment management industry, which really is bad, right? So there's a reason that passive is eating our lunch. It's because by and large, and of course we're like Wobegon, you know, we're all above average when you talk to us individually, but by and large investment management has failed to deliver returns in excess of a benchmark net of fees. So when you, when you start with that position of um, weakness and industry deterioration because of the passive boom, and then you turn around and say, what do the people who are generating those results look like? And find that you know 90% of them are men and the vast majority of them are um, Caucasian men. Uh, that really gives us, I think, an opportunity that you don't necessarily find in some of the other, what we call the bro industries. So the ones that are very male dominated. So if you look at the technology industry, for example, um, it, is, it has a culture that is very male. However, by and large, election shenanigans with Facebook notwithstanding, generally people are happy with their iPhones, right? So people like <laughs> social media, they like their, their iPhones. So 
So, you know, those are industries where I think it, it's almost harder to make the case for diversity because at least they seem to be doing something right for the consumer. Whereas ours, I think you can argue al along a number of different measures that we have failed to do that. Um, some of the themes that Corey mentioned that we pick up on in the book, which I think sort of apply equally to, to women and to, to people of color, uh, that concept of people who, I, I, if I am a senior manager, I am more likely to gel with and thus promote via these implicit kind of back channel promotional cadence mechanisms, um, people who are white men, because white men are basically, you know, sort of the people running the show. Um, I loved the, the anecdote about navigating the corporate world at Barclays when you started there, Corey. And I think the analog in our book is we spend a lot of time looking at the transition point from analyst to portfolio manager and in investment management, because that's, that's a typical feeder pipeline. Most people don't spring from the womb um, being a portfolio manager. You have to do your, <laughs> do your time as an analyst first. Um, and what we found there is two limiting factors for women. Um, the first is, to your point, there's not a lot of transparency around how you make that leap. And there's not a lot of great tools for pushing yourself from that analyst role into the, the portfolio manager role. Um, and men tend to have more confidence in a corporate setting. And in, and in general, there's a book that was actually written about that called The Confidence Code. Um, you don't even have to read the book. There's an Atlantic article written by the, the people who wrote the book that makes the same points in a much shorter format. Um, but it's it sort of ties back to that classic Harvard Business Review study that shows that a man will apply for a job when he only has 60% of the listed credentials versus a woman feeling that she has to have 100% of those credentials to put her hat in the ring. Given that the portfolio management job has at best very amorphous credentials, um, it's, it's harder for women to make the case, you know, I should be one of those people who makes that leap from analyst to portfolio manager. So I think that that, that stymies women um, once, once they're in the doors of investment management firms. Um, Going back a little bit further in the supply chain, um, as Jane mentioned, I teach as an adjunct at Columbia Business School. And the courses I teach, I'm a credit investor. So my courses are very investing oriented. Um, they tend to have about 10% women, which coincidentally is the, the, the headline statistic for portfolio managers. Um, and we did a survey for the book of the Student Investment Management Club at Columbia and heard lots of kind of corroborating factors related to that point about, I don't know what it takes to become a portfolio manager, even earlier in the supply chain. So women in business school might walk into a class with a lot of men who, either because they've done it before, they worked in investment banking, or they have some sort of finance background, or because they invested, you know, at a very young age, yeah. um, they just get turned off to the industry and say, you know what, this is not for me. I don't feel like I can compete with these people who already have this head start. One of the big points that we make in the book um, at the early stage of recruiting, and, and Corey, I'm curious to hear if you, I know it's not the exact same job, but if you had this experience, is that recruiters lionize actual investing experience. I graduated from business school almost 25 years ago now, but even then you were expected to walk into a room with your stock pitch completely developed. What other job do you have to do the job before you've actually done the <laughs> job, by the way? And it lends itself to, and to your points about, you know, the, the sort of background differentials between theoretically equally cap capable um, applicants. I remember talking, you know, year after year, once I worked at Capital, to these earnest young men who talked about how they bought Starbucks stock when they were six because their mom couldn't walk past the Starbucks <laughs> kiosk without getting her latte. Um, and so there's a whole set of assumptions there about, um, first about gender. So there are studies that show that even in the same family, parents talk to sons and daughters differently about money and investing. Yeah. And then obviously the investable wealth element. So, you know, most of us did not grow up with like our little Schwab brokerage account that our dad funded for us when we were five so that we could play around with Starbucks and Lululemon stock. Um, so we think in the book, we make the point that even just taking that aspect out of the recruiting would certainly cast a wider net and identify talent with a lot more creativity. And frankly, you know, to Corey's point, a lot more of those 
earlier experiences that probably make you a much better, you know, sort of rounded person who then can go out and find better investment ideas or at least more diverse investment ideas. So far, we've been quite anecdotal, but I, I guess that the Financial Services Skills Commission uh, has found some some more sort of formal um, evidence of what we've been talking about. And um, uh, actually, one thing that one of the things that very much surprised me, um, and I'm sure you'll come on to this, is that there's still actually quite poor data on yeah. diversity and inclusion. Yeah, can I can I sort of I'll, I'll talk about that, Jane, because I think it's yes. it's a really key part of it. But I'll just respond to to Corey. Um, you know, I. I I was listening, Corey, to what you were saying about your experiences. And so I come from a very different background. I mean, what I come from a white working class community in the Northeast. So my knowledge of um, business before I became, before I went to university and then went to join what was then Deloitte Haskins and Sales, as now BWC, was pretty limited. Uh, and I think there's something about social capital that people have and develop. That really helps them assimilate into firms. So you're, you're the, the thing you're probably making about writing emails. You know, <laughs> I think there is a whole host of people who start off with a disadvantage because they haven't got that social capital or that that background. And it is much easier to get into any form of employment if you start start with that. I was having a conversation at the weekend with some friends about intern experiences, um, <laughs> you know, and. You know, it is. You know, they were talking about where their children would want to get intern roles and who they're chatting to. It was about their network of contacts. Yeah. So that makes it easier, but it also means if you have to ask somebody, "What's it like being a lawyer?" If you come from a family with uh, with no lawyers, you're at a disadvantage. Yeah. Compared to someone who's a family of lots of lawyers, and just I just think there are there are so many barriers there to recruitment that stem from that lack of social capital, that lack of understanding or, or network. And I think that's quite a big challenge for financial services. And it was you know, Ellen's comment about people having investment experience uh, at the age of six. You know, not many people I know had the money to invest at the age of six when I was at the school I was <laughs> at. Um, yeah, so you're already at that, at that disadvantage. But you know, so I think that those anecdotes are, are there, and I think they actually bring to life some of the challenges. But, but Jane, you were talking about data. Look, I think this is one of the big starting points, big challenges facing the sector, is the data that's available. Um, that, you know, if we talk to members of the Financial Services Skills Commission, you know, they are much better at collecting data about gender. You know, that, that's quite well entrenched. Or, in their organizations, there's a you know, requirement to report the gender pay gap. So there, there's already a base of data that they can use in order to start to identify the challenge they face within their organization. But that's, that data is not available for other groups and other characteristics. Uh, so on recruitment, for example, most firms are very good at understanding the demographics of their graduate recruitment pool. They're not great when it comes to collecting data on school and school leavers joining their firms or mid-career moves, where someone moves between firms. So if, you, if you're not collecting data on recruits at all aspects of your organization, you really are lagging behind. You're having a real challenge in order to um, understand where the inequalities and differences are within your organization and how do you then uh, tackle those now there is there is more data if you think about the sort of the, the maturity of different um, the work done with different groups in order to tackle diversity and inclusion firms are doing better more recently in collecting data uh, about people from a BAME background but quite often that's just one it's just dealt with as one characteristic, rather than identifying their, you know, their people from different black uh, backgrounds, different Asian, different minority ethnic groups. So they, that need to disaggregate is, is a challenge. But the area that I'm particularly interested in, partly because it reflects my own background and history, is around socioeconomic diversity, uh, where actually data collection is pretty poor 
it's almost at the bottom of the um, bottom of the chart in terms of how advanced firms are. So I think it's a real challenge. It is unless you collect the data and analyze it, you're you're fighting this battle with one arm tied behind your back. But to get that data from your your workforce, actually, what you need to do is persuade them that you're going to do something productive with it. <laughs> you know that it's not just data you're getting because it's a box to be ticked, but there's a purpose for collecting it, and that actually people can see the uh, benefit of it. Uh, and that's why some of the work that we've done identified very low take-up rates in some firms in terms of data collection, particularly around ethnicity, much higher rates elsewhere. Um, so there, there are people, there's a series of different levels of maturity across different demographic groups and then across different firms as well. Is that because is they're, I mean, basically you're asking firms to identify a problem. Um, and, you know, and I've been through this as, you know, I'm old enough to have been the first or second or, you know, tiny minority of women, um, whether it, Financial Times, I was only the second female assistant editor. Um, but that's, that, that, those sorts of numbers are absolutely stark. Um, and, but they're, because they're so stark and obvious, it's absolutely key. So they, they, look, it's shameful now, something has to be done. So to get the firms to buy in, they've got, almost got to say, right, oh, you know, where we're at now is shameful, effectively, and something must be done. So is, is that the source of the root? They'd rather sort of have their head in the sand and say, it's, oh, we've got the odd, you know, looks as though we've got a good sprinkling of people and we're all right. And so I think there are a couple of things. I think, you know, there are different sources of pressure to, to act. Uh, so things like gender, you know, you, you've got the gender pay gap, in financial services, the Women of Finance Charter, where you had a, you know, there's a huge um, moral and political pressure on people to start to, to, to collect that data. I think we're just, I think we're just further behind the curve on different, as, different demographic as, uh, characteristics. Um, so you need, I think, for, to, to, to identify what the levers are that will encourage people to collect more data. So do you go down the statutory requirement route? Do you rely upon peer pressure? Uh, so you know, mm -hmm. there's a, um, a task force that the Dunham Corporation a, has launched on socioeconomic diversity, where a lot of that is around uh, peer pressure. Uh, do you need to persuade people there's, there's, as well as there being a societal good around improving diversity and inclusivity, that actually there's a business imperative. So, so the research that Ellen has done, you, know, you, you find that there's a strong business benefit from diversity that again can be a, a driver. But then also you've got the regulatory pressure. So the, the consultation document that uh, the bank, the PRA and the FCA put out in July says actually from, you know, we as regulators believe there's a reason linked to the achievement of our regulatory objectives, why we think firms should collect this data. So I think there's just a variety of, of levers, but I think for a lot of firms, they just see this is a, a challenge to collect the data, but also to understand what it is they should do with it once they've got it. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, well, welcome back, Ellen. Um, Thank you. The, the number, num you know, number of um, points have been raised and, and thanks very much for getting the ball rolling. Um, this issue of performance, because um, I suppose um, I get a bit nervous about this and it's parallels with some, some nervousness about um, uh, sort of, you know, sustainability investing, that it's as if, um, oh, as long as you can imp prove that performance is better, um, then that'll be, that's all right then. And I actually, think you know and this has been a debate going on actually for some decades i actually think you have to start with fairness and you and with equal opportunities and making the best use of the talent pool um but as mark has just said the um the british uh, financial regulatory authorities in in starting to push for uh, diversity and inclusion that they're, they're coming at it in, a, in an interesting way saying well we think that um Cognitive diversity is important for uh, financial soundness, you know, and, you know, th there's also sort of more 
uh, perhaps a more cliched view that women are um, better, you know, perhaps better at uh, uh, monitoring risks, and whereas men might be more, um, you know, plow on regardless. So, Ellen, where do, where do you come from on this in this sort of debate about, you know, the importance of showing some sort of specific performance improvement, or or or, or is it just, you know, we're just talking fairness here? I believe it's both. Um, so I, I caught a little bit of what, <clears throat> excuse me, Mark was saying. Um, and I, I think, well, let, let's start with the risk element. So one of the things that we think holds women back in investment management is people's different perception of with women's risk appetite. And that manifests in two ways. First, it, it manifests specifically in investing. And so you, to your point, Jane, um, men tend to have a higher appetite for risk and a higher comfort with risk uh, to a fault, right? We have not necessarily seen that translate into better results over time. What we heard from a lot of uh, management level people in investment management is women, if they are perceived that they, they can't or don't want to take as much risk as men, then sometimes that holds them back because investing is perceived to be an industry where you have to take risk or else you're not doing your job. Um, this again goes back to echoes some of the things at the MBA level where you know men are willing to take um, risk in a classroom setting by raising their hand or putting forth their idea, their investment proposal before women do. Um, and what we tell investment management firms to do in these circumstances is to just change the way that you listen to women and men and make sure that um, you know if, if women are talking about an, an investment's merits, but they also present the downside case or um, you know, they have a more risk nuanced view of it than men do. That doesn't mean that they're potentially worse investors. It just means that their framework is different. Sometimes that can mean that they're better investors. Um, I say this uh, as a fixed income person. So of course I'm going to say this, but I think one of the things that is so detrimental to our industry, which has nothing to do with gender is the way that we are gauged relative to a benchmark. So very few firms that I'm familiar with have a risk element incorporated into that. And especially in fixed income, what that means is because, especially in the higher quality parts of the fixed income market, such as investment grade bonds, if you just take more risk, then four years out of five, you're gonna do great. You're gonna trounce the benchmark. Then in that fifth year, a year like 2008 or the early part of 2020, you are going to get decimated, but because there's no risk adjusted metric for those good years, then it doesn't penalize you um, on the downside as much if, if you're taking home a bonus relative to the benchmark compensation, which is how most of us are compensated. Um, so again, there, I think, you know, changing benchmark uh, compensation metrics would, would help um, accomplish that weighing the, the risk case um, equally. The other way in which women don't take risk is in their careers. So that goes back to some of the earlier points I made about you know, not feeling confident in putting forth their name for the portfolio manager role. Um, we heard over and over again how important networking is in our industry. And it's a little bit head scratching because a lot of people start out thinking they wanna be in investment management because it is a true, theoretically, a true meritocracy, right? You are judged by your performance relative to a benchmark. Um, but given that we know that many, many managers fail to meet their benchmarks, then obviously that's not the only criterion driving um, the ascension of people into the portfolio management role. One of my favorite quotes was actually from a man um, in the book, and he said, uh, men tend to network with people who are going to get them their next job. Women network with people who they want to be bridesmaids at their wedding. So that, that is a risk-taking mentality on the part of a man, right? So you are reaching up, you're managing up. That is a risky endeavor. Um, it's, it's uncomfortable, but it's something that both men and women need to do to get ahead in our industry. And it's just something that structurally men seem to be better at doing. So again, going back to what's the fix for this, um, analyzing data at the investment management firms about promotions, about even the, the sectors of coverage that men versus women are given. So there's this um, sort of bias towards giving women the, the softer sectors when they start out as analysts. Uh, anecdotally, I covered retail. That was my first sector back in 1999 when I, when I graduated from business school. Um, if you look at the number of women covering the retail sector versus the number of um, women covering the technology sector, it's vastly different. 
And it's, it's very easy to figure out that that's the case, right? If you're an investment management firm, you just analyze your own data and look at it over, you know, decades of time and see what you're doing. Um, and, and we're a little bit puzzled why our industry doesn't, we, we are an industry of analysts, right? We analyze data, numbers, we look at companies, we ask management teams probing questions, but we don't seem to do as good a job of it when it comes to our own ranks. So even just some simple data mining and analysis can help investment management yeah. firms see those trends. Yeah, that, and that's the sort of thing Mark was talking about. So Corey, in your, do you have any um, experiences where um, it's been clear that having different perspectives on an issue has, has really helped, you know, or where you thought, oh, you know, oh my goodness, why are they all saying the same thing? Yeah, so um, I've got a slightly different view on, on, on this, that um, a lot of the kind of experiences and, and kind of perspectives that I've seen is, is more so down to, I'm going to be a bit outspoken here and say this, that um, in certain, you know, demographics, um, there comes a, a, a lot more analysis or, or less analysis. So what I, what I mean by that is that, generally speaking, um, when a, a, a woman uh, uh, or a male, they analyze um, the opportunities very differently. Um, so uh, uh, I guess I'm saying that a, a female would analyze a situation and the risks, the pros and cons, you know, is this going to help me or not? Is this, you know, is this, is this fair? Um, do, do I think that someone else deserves this more than me? Um, is someone else better, better than this, better at this than me? Um, and that almost over analysis can be, a, you know, at, at the, their detriment, whereas uh, a male would just say, I'm going to go for this because I want this or I want more money. Yeah. Um, and and I think in, in the simplistic terms that, that those different kind of um, features or kind of characteristics that, you know, come naturally or maybe nurture, you know, depending on how your race common attitudes can can change and characteristics can change based on you know who, who you've been raised by what type of family you've had you know who's been the predominant you know role models in your life can determine how your your kind of your decisions are made um and that's why i feel like that maybe those different di those differences happen in terms of seeking opportunities um whether that be in in a role or you know transitioning from one role to another or just starting out is that those those the way we analyze things is very very different um yeah so i think i think you're getting one so one thing you're this is elucidating is uh what we've known about for a long time which is unconscious bias you know i'm, I'm you know opportunity 2000 we've banged on and on and on about consciousness raising so it's a mark in in the work of your commission um how do you tackle something that's we, we know it's there um but unconscious bias but how you know how do you how do you tackle that well let alone measure it so i so one of the pieces of work that we've done uh recently we published in just for the summer holidays is a, an inclusion measurement guide mm -hmm. and the this is this recognizes that firms are at different stages in their maturity in delivering uh more inclusive workplaces and I think what, where, this, where this work gets us to is to help firms move along a maturity curve. But the further you move along it, the questions that we ask are more granular and more detailed. And actually trying to measure, so it starts off, do you have a policy in place that will encourage people to speak out mm. and speak up? So it's very straightforward. You know, by the time you get towards the higher levels on inclusivity, you're, at, you're seeking to ask the views of your staff are your, is your voice heard or is it listened to? So is this inclusive workplace really genuinely inclusive or is there some, um, or is it just a you know, set of policies? And I think by actually trying to listen to people's experiences and understanding, it goes back a, a bit, Jane, to the data. If you end up uh, your workforce saying that, that certain groups say, well, actually my voice isn't heard, in the workforce, that would suggest that bias is, is still still there. So actually understanding about to track and monitor that bias, I think then helps give an insight into where do we need to work uh, in order to uh, tackle areas of unconscious bias or where practices 
just haven't been updated to reflect where you know, current guidance. But there is a difficulty, and I think and Ellen um, writes about this, um, the sort of consciousness raising, consciousness, um, if you send people on awareness courses um, and you think, okay, great, you know, job done. But actually, I think, Ellen, you say that the, sometimes this can be counterproductive. Why, why, why is that? What studies have shown with bias training is that it can work poorly in one of two ways. Either it can give people license going forward because they say, well, I did the bias training, so I can't be biased anymore. So that means that whatever it is I'm doing- Inoculated, double jabbed, maybe. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Or I even got my booster. Um, so there's that path. And then the other path, and, and as a parent, I'm sure Corey, you can relate to this too, it's the difference between negative and positive reinforcement, right? So if you bring a bunch of people into the room and you yell at them about how they're not doing a good job and they're not promoting women and people of color at the same rate, then they can say, well, why should I even bother? Because I'm obviously, you know, doing something bad, not, not sort of fulfilling the, the bias, unbiased role that I'm supposed to. One of the things that does seem to work is reframing bias training as ally training. And that was one of the really positive and exciting messages um, that we, we came upon when we were writing the book. By and large, we don't work in, in what I would call sort of a sleazy industry of, you know, we, we, we say in the book that we, we might manage money for the Harvey Weinsteins of the world, but we don't work with many or really any of them. Most of the men that we talk to for the book and that we encounter in our day-to-day -day professional lives are genuinely puzzled by this problem too, and actually would like to help, especially the men at you know, more senior levels of the organization. They're just not exactly sure how. And training them about how to be allies to women. And so these are tangible things like, you know, make sure when you're going through your analyst rankings as a portfolio manager, make sure that you think about the names that the women kept you out of, or, or that the analysts kept you out of, as well as the names that did really well, those, those 10 baggers, which is a term I'd like to abolish because it really seems sort of male. 10 what? Ten. Um, 10 bagger. So a 10 bagger is a stock that appreciated that went up by 10x. Doesn't that sound male? Um, so, you know, it's, it's really being very nuanced in the way that you evaluate um, all of the analysts in your pool, if you're looking at analysts or portfolio managers, um, and that is a way in which men can be allies for women um, without having to go through a lot of bias training or, you know, sort of being told that they're doing something wrong from the outset. Yeah. And I just also wanted to just talk a little bit about um, some of the practical issues. And what, I mean, some, some of these may, uh, may have been um, amplified by COVID. I mean, what in terms of work-life balance and um, um, actually, I've just been reading Marianne Seek Seekart's book on the authority gap, which is never knowingly understated, um, but it does quite, you know, clearly make the point that um, you aren't going to have e equality of opportunity at work until you've got equality of uh, doing the chores at home. Um, so what, um, perhaps Alan, Ellen, you'd like to add something on this and then bring the others in. What, what is, where are we at in terms of sort of some of the practical issues to do with mixing working life? With, with family life and um actually and i remember when, when i was a sort of boss at the ft i used to try to think you know we must not have jobs that mothers can't do um which is a sort of gender stereotype way of thinking about it but you just some, somehow you've got to get get there in terms of um changing the culture yeah we actually we have an entire chapter devoted to work-life balance in our book because as, as challenging as work-life balance is basically in any sort of high professional status job for, for women in particular, we don't think that that's the primary thing holding women back in our industry. Um, and the reason for that is that it's, it's a, almost an unsung hero, um, dirty little secret of investment management, but it is not as time intensive as a lot of other high profile careers that have much better gender representation. So if you think about corporate law, um, the people I, I, because I'm in high yield, um, I have been through my share of bankruptcies and the corporate lawyers who work on those bankruptcies and do workouts and restructurings, they work, you know, 80 plus hours a week. And there are more of them who are women than there are of me who are women. So um, we really don't think that work-life balance is, is any more of a challenge. And in some cases, less of a challenge because all you really need is your Bloomberg terminal and, you know, a Zoom screen if you're doing a, a company meeting with management teams. 
Um, and you can, even though people talk about, you know, the market hours driving your working hours, that's not really true. So of course, this is going to differ by markets, but let's take the high yield bond market as an example. Most of the trading that happens takes place in the very early hours of the market's opening. Um, and then the rest of the day is really spent on analyzing companies, you know, if you're a portfolio manager, meeting with analysts, meeting with company management teams. And those are things that can be structured in a fairly flexible way. Um, I would like to think that COVID and the work from home revolution is actually going to help more women in investment management specifically, because once employees see that this job can be done flexibly from home and that performance is not suffering because of the work from home element, in fact, you know, maybe better um, because you can really focus on your spreadsheet or whatever, you know, um, systems you're looking at then maybe that gives women a bigger opportunity in this mm. specific industry. Yeah, but that, and of course that's just, it does assume two things. One is that people do have um, yeah, computers to which they've got exclusive or access at home uh, and, the, and the space and that it's quiet enough. I mean, I don't know what Corey, you think about this. If you were having to work at home with um, small children, for example, um, you know, so, so um, I, it sounds, on the whole, it's increased flexibility, but um, what do you think, Corey? I mean, work, flexibility to work from home, is that the, is that a sort of, it's not a panacea, is it? Uh, I, I think it's definitely a, a, a move in the right direction. Um, just that I feel like in terms of work-life balance, people that, when we go to work, we kind of take it as our maybe time apart from the family to have, you know, our, our little break away from the kids. Um, and they go to school, et cetera. Um, but I feel like having that work-life balance and having that opportunity to work from home gives you a ability as a male, uh, specifically who, you know, generally we have that sort of stereotype that you're the breadwinner and you go to work and then, you know, the, the mother will stay at home with the kids or work part-time or have a, a less important job as we, we might call it. Um, that working from home allows that 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 balance in, 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 in sharing that, that 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 home life that if you are at home some of the time that you can help out with the washing and you can help out with you know the children or doing the school runs and that gives you that invaluable time to 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 have as as a parent and enjoy being a parent as well as having a, a good successful career um and i'm kind kind of touching on the the the, the bit where you said um you know if you don't have that, that same balance at home, how can you have it in, in the workplace? So I'm, I'm completely against this whole, there are roles that we play in society and roles that we play in the house. Um, and kind of, I'm kind of making it a bit personal to me that in my house, we've kind of got a, a board of, you know, jobs and those jobs are ca categorized into different colors um, and those colors can overlap. So you, you have a color job, um, that job is associated to you to do on a daily basis, weekly basis, whenever you do it. But then there's also those merged or interconnected jobs like that anybody can do. And, and that's, that's our house trying to say, okay, we're diffusing this, you do this and you do this, and trying to say as much as we can, we're gonna merge them together. And eventually there's not gonna be a separate, separate role to play, but our roles are interconnected and our roles are shared. Um, I feel like the whole shared uh, parental leave has definitely helped that as well. So I know people that are definitely taken advantage of, I'm going to spend six months at home as a dad and my wife's going to go back to work after six months. Um, that sort of thing definitely helps that work-life balance and there's that interconnectedness in the family. There's so many times when I've heard, you know, my friends say, when I was younger, my dad was never at home. And that's kind of takes away the, you know, each child needs a good balance, male, female, um, in terms of their, their upbringing and how they're gonna shape their future. And that definitely plays a role in, you know, the, the way we look at jobs, the way we look at careers, um, to see that I can do this because, you know, I've had both role models give me the opportunity rather than saying, well, I've got to say, and we're just looking at traditional families to say, you know, one mum, one dad, two children, boy and boy, girl, male, female. Um, 
if we see role models that are my dad's going to go to work and and my mum's going to stay at home most of the time we're automatically going to think my brother's going to follow in my dad's footsteps and you know my sister is going to you know follow in my mum's footsteps maybe um but more so not in in my dad's footsteps so therefore I feel like if there was that togetherness in the terms of work-life balance and working from home enables that that you can see more of both parents then definitely that kind of will revolutionize the the industry to say that it's okay to for for both parents to be at home and it gives that perspective and that well-balanced perspective for for either you know male or female children yeah, I, th- I love your board. I think that should you, that should be sort of you should patent that as a sort of uh, <laughs> how how couples can move to an <laughs> integrated approach, and also how people like me can instead of saying we shouldn't have jobs that mothers can do, is saying we mustn't have jobs that parents can't do because <laughs> so easy to, easy to be dated. Um, Mark, was there anything you wanted to add on this sort of work life balance before we just ask each of you to to, to round up? Yeah, just one thing I would say. You know, so the the role of the Financial Services Skills Commission. It's work across the sector to help boost uh, the level of skills in the workforce. And the reason why we're interested in diversity and inclusion is that you, you need to access the broadest possible pool of talent, not just at recruitment, but also at retention and promotion. Mm. Uh, and so actually, I think that uh, if there's been a benefit from the dreadful you know, pandemic we've been through, it's actually, it, it's actually given us permission to be more flexible about how we work. Uh, the number of emails I get with the signature line saying, I've chosen to send this email at this time because it suits me. I don't expect you to, to reply because I work flexibly is good. You know, I've learned a lot more about my co- colleagues over the course of the last 18 months by seeing their homes, their children, their cats, their dogs. <laughs> it's humanized the workforce, but it actually it's given people permission to say, I don't need to be in the office every hour, every day to be effective, I can be effective from home, I can be effective in the work, at, at work. I need some choice about how I, how I run my life. And I think, it, I think the benefit of this is to improve um, flexibility and will actually improve the pool of talent financial services can, can, can draw from. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a huge benefit. And it's not just flexibility in terms of the hours we work, it's also changing about where we work. You know, one of the businesses I'm, 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 I chair, we've recruited somebody who will be able to come into the office for a day, a fortnight, who we wouldn't previously have thought about employing because they live just too far away to be in the office every day sensibly. So suddenly you create some geographical mobility and flexibility that wasn't there as a consequence of that. Yeah, so we're all examples of the moment of what, what they, my colleagues at the FT call home at work, as opposed yeah. to, <laughs> which has, which is, yeah, better for flexibility, not 100% great, but better. Uh, well, Mark, that actually, that was a wonderful beginning to the, to the roundup. And I think it also it was well worth reminding us that what, what this is about is making the best use of the talent pool. So even if you want to get, like me, want to get away from real, getting bogged down in specific measures of improvements in business performance related to diversity. I think the sort of idea of um, a general economic and social benefit from having equal opportunity, making best use of talent, I would have thought that's fairly unarguable, um, Mark. So I think, you know, very important to bring that in. So just, um, uh, um, Corey, do you have um, just a final message to give? I think I think that the, the future is um is is a couple of things. I think the first one is all about role models and what we see, um and it's very much about you know our surroundings and if if we're going to get a diverse you know workforce or di- more diversity in terms of financial services, it's got to be those role models to to steer the way. You know, if, if that's ethnic minorities and more ethnic minorities going to schools and colleges or universities to 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 show that. You know, if you visually see a role model in front of you and they give you the same experiences you're going through, it gives you encouragement and enthusiasm and energy to want to go in that direction. Yeah. And I, I, I would say from my perspective, that was definitely my driver to see I have an older brother who worked for uh, a, a bank. And that was something that said, I can do it if he did. 
Um, and there needs to be more of that for the younger generation to show that encouragement, especially from, you know, um, backgrounds that are not well off. Um, generational wealth plays a, a massive role in this as well, is that those opportunities come from having, you know, networks and, um, you know, family members or, or, or friends or families that can provide opportunities and to, to, to steer. I know a lot of my friends kind of had opportunities presented to them because they um, had, you know, their, my friend's dad or my friend's mum works in this organisation and I'm, I see what, th what they have or, you know, I saw them on TV or I saw a poster with them on or it was a brochure with their face and those gave them encouragement. Um, and, and I feel like that's a big part to play in this is how do we, you know, if that's, you know, ethnic minorities, if that's gender, if that's just having a you know a younger workforce as well to, to pave that way, it's 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 got to be that those role models you know steer the direction and give the opportunities. Yeah, and also I mean people like you you know have to uh, all of us need to be sort of generous with our time you know going to talk to not just not just people we know but to groups of strangers as well as we're doing now. So, um, Ellen, um, last words with you. So what's your what's your final? You've got a, any can I just questions? say what what Corey said? Because yeah. <laughs> um, it's uh, one thing I didn't mention that we talk about in the book is this concept of the investment management flywheel, and I think that's an engineering term. My co-author has some engineering background. I do not, but uh, to Corey's point, at all points in the flywheel, you need to see more people who look like you, and it all begets the next thing. So you have to start at the at the C suite, right? Look at the C-suite of investment management firms. And then that goes down to the senior, senior management roles. And then that in turn goes down to the entry level roles. And then that in turn goes down to the MBA and even the, the undergrad level. So um, Jane, I love your comment about we all need to be more generous with our time. My challenge to everyone that I work with is really go out into your communities. Um, there are a lot, we have donated the proceeds of our book to an organization called Rock the Street Wall Street, which goes into high schools, public high schools in the United States, and um, teaches girls about investing and financial literacy concepts, and also introduces them to potential role models in the community who um, can tell them, hey, this is what my job is like. I made a good living doing this job. I love my job. So I really like that message of, of making sure that you share your time as a mentor. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've... Um, um, even sort of probably 50 years after I first became a, a women's liberal or a feminist, I've learned um, more from this conversation. Thank you very much to all of you. Um, and um, uh, let's, uh, let's hope we see if we re-met in a year's time, we would have some <laughs> more progress to report. So thank you very much to all of you. Thank you.